Valentine's Day, February 14th, coming at the public school um, board session. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Ms. Anderson Holman? Here. Mr. Bertinoff? Here. Ms. Crawford? Here. Dr. Chris Gonzalez? Here. Ms. Tribbin? Here. Ms. Wallace? Here. Ms. Ema? Here. Okay. Number two on our agenda for this evening is our public comment session. Section, we do have at least six that have signed up in person. Um, Ms. Holman, do you have a number of those that may have emailed there? We only have one that's, that's been submitted in writing. Okay, one submitted in writing. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and take care of the ones that are here in person. Um, I, I will just remind everyone that, um, thank you for putting your name here. There are There's one here that I can't read, so I'll probably ask you to, to give me your full name again so that I can just make sure that we have a good record of of who you are, and then Michelle, we would need your first name. So the first person we have up is Mr. Miller, Eric Miller. Okay. And remember, you have three minutes. Okay. So um, once that three minutes is expired, oh, yeah, great. I will motion you to please ask you to finish your mm -hmm. sentence, but then after that, we'll be done. So if you could keep it at three. Very good. Having a uh, taught at Daniel Morgan for 19 years, I'm used to being timed and under the gun. Okay, <laughs> good, perfect. So if you would state your name and address, and we'll All right, uh, my name is Eric Miller, uh, Daniel Morgan Middle School, 7th grade. I uh, live in Morgan County, uh, Johnson Mill Road, 4398. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to let uh, me come and speak tonight. And my primary focus is communication. The communication at Winchester Public Schools is pretty good. Like right now, if you're a teacher and you want to bring something forward, you can go to your administration. All right, you have the teacher advisory. Uh, you can email the superintendent director. So it's pretty good. Now, considering all the shifting sands and changing situations under COVID, I have noticed a situation occur that I'm like, mm, I wish there was another channel. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was watching the October 26th uh, school board meeting and when they were going to vote on testing. Comments were made by people putting forth the information from WPS. And as I sat there listening, I thought, well, if I was there, I would like to say this or this or that. And these would be like CDC or UC Davis. Information has just come out that kind of contradicted what good natured people were saying here. The meeting went through, the motion was passed, the testing went through. I did talk to my administration. I sent an email to Dr. Van Hoyt. He was kind enough to come see me. The only situation was it was kind of too late because the policy had been voted on. And I, I think there needs to be almost another channel. And I know how organizations work, but I was in the Army as well, myself, general staff guy, tank guy. So I know everything can't be micromanaged. But if I could have like talked to the people that were giving that or different like a day after review or something, it would have clarified a lot. Because I said, what you said about a certain group of people has been countered by like a CDC, UC Davis, and other things. And there was just no way for me to really express what I was going to say in a meaningful way because it had been voted on, it was moving forward. Dr. Van Hoytman came in my room, we had probably about an hour long conversation, candid, frank, and honest. So I'll give it to him, you know, that was very good. Larger school system, something like that would never happen. But for a teacher to go directly to the board, shy of like picking one or two people, some of you I know kind of well, and others I've never met. So I'm th if I'm a 19 year veteran, how would a younger teacher, or other people with other frustrations, there's a lot of people out there, obviously, with concerns, how do we bring that forward, especially if it's like a very time sensitive thing? So in my 29 seconds I have remaining, mm -hmm. I would just say, is there some way we could consider a, another more fluid, more flexible means of communication that teachers go to, whether there were two members of the board that were appointed that teachers could go to, something like that. So I think, that would benefit teachers, it would cut back on frustration, and it would be able to make the decision making process run more smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. The next up we have Ms. Grace Foley. If you would again state your name and address for the record, please. Grace Foley. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what Eric said. A lot of you have heard from me already. This has been particularly frustrating for me because I talk to teachers a lot. And so I know their frustrations. And this particularly was one of my own frustrations. So on September 14th, there was a policy voted in in regards to incentivizing the vaccine, which was not a big issue. It was a little bit frustrating for those of us who didn't want to provide of vaccination um, but at the same time 
you kind of get used to that at this point in COVID and no one's going to navigate COVID perfectly. So I definitely don't want to put that expectation on anyone, but that just kind of hit my radar on the 14th. Um, and then on the 26th, when that vote, vote went through at that point, it was the height of the Delta variant. And I do know someone's going to do a COVID mitigation presentation. I've gone through their agenda notes and um, mentioned that that was voted in. But I do think someone made a comment that even at that time, there wasn't necessary, necessarily data to necessitate singling out a particular group. Um, so it was a little alarming. And then when there was that... Um, what was the chart? It was like a potential problem analysis chart. The first thing I heard every WPS employee say was, why wasn't I included in that focus group? And I felt the same way. So that was also a little bit frustrating because now there was like a policy and then we were going to get tested, but it also felt like we weren't totally prepared to roll out a testing program. And this was post our contract. So we didn't really have the opportunity to even think through like, hey, do I want to be employed somewhere that I'm going to be tested? And then for the next couple of months, it was kind of like, well, you have a choice. You can either stay at WPS or you can get tested. And that was a little frustrating because you're already dedicated to the teachers and the students. And it's not just a quick pivot at that point. Um, yeah, and then personally, because a lot of people share my VAC status or their VAC status at DMMS, basically January 1st through January 10th, I knew who was falling out of the building at Daniel Morgan. There was obviously an outbreak situation there. If you look at your internal data, surely it will show you who was out and it was not unvaccinated or people who weren't providing proof of vaccination. So um, bringing that to the awareness of some and then still kind of going hard on this like mandate. If you're not providing proof of vaccination, you have to test. It was additionally frustrating. And my big thing was medical privacy. And then um, I know it's no one's fault. I'm not blaming anyone. But I just felt like, again, it was a layer of how unprepared we were to execute this type of program. All our names went out um, to the whole world. <laughs> and that was just a, another thing that was frustrating. So yeah, just opening up lines of communication, realizing that this has been hard for us and just trying to be heard by you all and just have responses would be like super helpful. So thank you. Our next public comment is from Michelle C. Kane. Kane. Yes. Can you spell it for me? K-A-Y-N-E. Okay, thank you. And once you get to the polling, if you could again just say your name and I'll hold it up. Michelle Kane, I'm with Transportation. I'm a bus driver. I'm a substitute driver, so I take a lot of abuse on the kids, and it's okay. I, I, I'm committed. My boss asked me to stay for the year, and since we're so short, and I do, I, I totally. And on the bus, you know, sometimes they'll say F U, F U B. I get that a lot. You know, I know kids are showing off or um, an attitude, but sometimes I feel like I get that attitude from HR, F U. Especially when you sent out that list, not only to the employees, but employees that are no longer with or ex employees. And that was just uncalled for. I don't see how that was a mistake when it's sent to everybody like that. Also, I felt that attitude when I received a, a couple of phone calls that if I don't get tested, and I have my reason not to. I'll just say that there's been people coming to work and it's sick. It's to really be fair about it, everybody needs to be tested because we all know vaccinated people. Right. So, but um, oh, I was told that if I don't consent to testing, I will be put on leave without pay. Uh, first it was two months, then it was the rest of the year, then it was indefinitely, and I would no longer receive my benefits. You know that, when that happened, you don't know what we go through with that stress and anxiety. I say shame on you for saying that, for that bullying and an intimidation. I get that on the bus, and then I get it from HR, and ultimately from you. That's where you, the orders come from. And I put in my list exemption back in October, and I didn't hear back until February 2nd. Another FU attitude. 
and I'm and keep me hanging like this. I still don't know if I'll have a job till the end of the year. I don't know if my health benefits will be taken away because nobody wants to, to man up and let let us know what's going on. It's always it's like, well, you're kind of doing this as it plays out. And I tell you, most 99% of the kids don't want to wear these masks. I find them all over my bus. They're not wearing them on the bus. Uh, I don't. I really don't think any of you sit. And wear their ma wear your mask as long as these kids do in school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Before we go on to our next public comment, I am going to ask those that have already spoken, Ms. Payne, if you don't mind. What I need for you guys is to actually list your home address, not the area that you work in, which is within the Winchester Public School. So if I can pass this back around for those that have already provided public comment, if you could add that information, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, our next speaker we have is Makisha Gordon. If you could get to the podium, please state your name, your full address for the record. My name is Makisha Gordon, and uh, I am a seventh grade science teacher at Daniel Morgan Middle School. Um, thank you for your time. I have been a part of the WPS school board family since 2014, in which I serve alongside a very dynamic and diverse and impactful team of educators. A vibrant, strongly niched and diverse community is really what Winchester really is, which is a key factor in my decision um, in joining the WPS family almost eight years ago. However, we are not immune to what is taking place all around us, both locally, statewide, and on a national level. As a community that strives to create a sense of belonging, this desire to be valued, respected, and heard, especially in the academia setting, could not be more relevant than in these fluid times that we're currently navigating through. I think, it's safe, I think it is safe to assume that we've been made aware of the unfortunate events um, surrounding uh, COVID bias, restrictions, and mandates uh, that have taken place in many areas, such as in Loudoun and Frederick County schools. However, I would think that we would, as a close-knit family, uh, would not want to echo these discriminatory practices uh, of these counties. Amongst all the differences that we have, there is indeed ultimately one commonality that we share in the w WPS community, and that is the innate desire uh, to be valued and truly listened to, and to the right and the right to have our, um, you know, to make our own personal choice when it regards medical life decisions without being discriminated against. But when one group, the unvax members, is not allowed the same benefits as the other group, the vax members, that right to choose is greatly stifled. It is discriminatory, to be honest. It sends the message that the unvaxxed members are not worthy to receive these incentivized 10 COVID days. My question is, how is it justifiable considering that our most current scientific data, such as in the Harvard study conducted by the U.S. National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health, have shown that the COVID-19 virus surge is most among the vaxxed members compared to that of the unvaxxed. The data from this institute also shows that this increase in COVID-19 are unrelated to the levels of vaccinations across 68 countries and 2,947 counties in the United States. Both the vaxxed and the unvaxxed are transmitting the virus and both suffer the physical, mental, and psychological effects from this relentless virus. And as a, dedica as a dedicated educator, I, along with many others in this community, wear many different hats um, in the classroom. Daily, we dedicate our hearts and minds to ensure that we're doing whatever it takes to provide the best education to our students that we can. We work for and serve a community of a young generation who will ultimately pave the way for future generations. Um, of all the life lessons that we're blessed enough to teach, uh, is this the lesson that we really want to teach our youth? That if you make a personal medical choice that isn't approved by others, then you will not be given the same treatment as others. What happens to voice and choice for us as educators? What happened to equity regarding us? Does this not apply to us? So, can I leave you with one question? Yes, please. Okay. I'll leave you with this question with a hopes of a timely response. How is it equitably justifiable to discriminate between the vaxxed and unvaxxed teachers through intentional incentivized benefits? And I would ask you this time if you would consider at this point revisiting and revising this policy. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Gordon. If you don't mind, if you did not state your address, if you don't mind filling that out a little bit. Okay. Sure. But she got appreciated. All right, next up we have um, Ms. Gordon. Please forgive me. This is the, the um, name I wasn't sure about, but it's here to be William Little. Yes. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Mr. Little, once you reach the podium, please state your full name and the physical address. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, right, good evening. My name is William H. Little III. I live at 500 Miller Street in Chester, Virginia. I thank you for your time. Um, as far as I think everybody that's already spoken, and quite frankly, as a, 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 a parent of a pre-kindergartner and a kindergartner, uh, I'm going to be new to this. And I have a feeling from here on out, you're going to see a lot of me, and I'm going to participate and, and we walk together uh, through this. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about things because I will tell you, each and every one of you, as I think I explained to him, uh, throughout this process, you guys have done a lot of great work, and I appreciate that. Okay, um, I, I don't know how hard that would be. With that being said, uh, today the General Assembly, the General Assembly, took a significant step for parents and children. After passing both chambers of the General Assembly, SB 739 will give parents a choice regarding their child's health, education, upbringing, and care. My question to the school board is, is William Winchester Public Schools committed and prepared to communicate a line with the new law? Kids across the Commonwealth win with this bipartisan vote. Parents are now empowered to decide whether their child, children should wear a mask in school. Youngkin promised that as governor, Virginia would move forward with an agenda that empowers parents on the upbringing, education, and care of their children. This vote also shows that school boards who are balking at their own students are stunningly detached from reality. Winchester Public School, it's time to put kids first and get back to normal. I think it's important to mention that the bill, section 22.1-2.1, specifically says, notwithstanding any other provision of, of law or any regulation, rule, or policy implemented by a school board, school division, school official, other state or local authority, the parent of any child enrolled in a public elementary and or secondary school or in any school-based early childhood care and education program may elect for such a child to not wear a mask while on school property. A parent making such an election shall not be required to provide a reason or any certification of that child's health or education status. No student shall suffer any adverse disciplinary or academic consequences as a result of this parental election. And then the following, the last part of it is, I think it's also good to point out over on when the, the executive order two went into place on 124, um, which one just public school we did not align with, but and I understand that. Um, at that point in time, there was 476 cases in Winchester um, with a seven-day average of 204. Uh, as of February 8th, when I ran the numbers, uh, and I'm sure, and I've been watching, they've been gone down, but I wanted to get a seven-day average. Uh, the cases are at 75 or a seven-day average of 95.6. So that significantly dropped into 24, and we now have a law into a in place uh, that we're just getting the, the governor's by. So I appreciate your time, and I thank you. And it's time to, to move forward and get back to teaching and work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Little. Um, that does include the, the in-person public comments that we have. What I would do is I would invite many of you that um, address the board just um, to kind of stay throughout the meeting and maybe give you some additional insight or answer some questions that you may have. So please feel free to do that. Um, um, excuse me, ma'am. I put my name on that link when I arrived and I haven't been told yet. Okay, what's your name, ma'am? Carla Herrera Fisher. I'm sorry. Okay, so Carla Herrera Fisher? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you're welcome to approach the podium. Please again state your name and address. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Carla Herrera Fisher, and I am super grateful to be here. I love my WPS family. I love it. I worked at Virginia Avenue, I worked at Dunker, and I love my administrators and everything about it. Um, during the time that I have worked in Winchester Public Schools, I felt welcome and supported. I felt safe and fairly treated. During the last board meeting, I shared with you a study from the CDC of a group of 469 people that contracted COVID. 74% were fully vaccinated and four of the five that end up at the hospital were individuals that were vaccinated. And this study from last year I just want to point out something. I'm sorry I'm repeating myself. This was the Delta variant. This is not only so I want to make that distinction. Last July, the CDC posted this study showing that batch people can get COVID, transmit COVID, and be hospitalized from COVID. Last July. That was before the school year even started. This school year, I have seen and experienced different things. You know, 
um, from disrespect of medical privacy, mishandle of personal medical information, discrimination for testing, you know, between unvaccinated and vaccinated people, um, discrimination when it comes to quarantine, that's for students and staff, you know, you have to go quarantine if you're vaccinated or not, and segregation of students that have to eat lunch separated from other students because they have to do that um, strict mandate of math. And, you know, no matter what's happening in other school systems or out there, this is not who we are. You know, this is not who we are. There is no logical reason to make any distinction between vaccinated people, unvaccinated people, and those who don't want to share that information. From last July, the CDC knows that vaccinated people get COVID, transmit COVID, and can be hospitalized from COVID. Why is this information not reflected in our policies and regulations? I, I don't understand. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I get really like, I'm laughing, so I get really you know, excited about it, but I, I love the school and I wanna see this information reflected in our policy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that concludes. I, I actually was here before six, however, no one was downstairs, so I had no idea what the meeting was until I actually found someone to direct me. So I was unable to find it. Okay. okay. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate well, it. Well, thank you for the podium. Please, if you would um, say your full name and address. Sure. My name is Victoria Mason. I live at 2072 Taylor Grace Court. I'm sorry. I'm going to be okay. Ask you to um, repeat your address one more time. Sure. 2072 yes. Taylor Grace Court. Okay. Thank Just, you. What's the zip, please? Winchester City 22601. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to say I was not here, but at John Kerr last school board meeting, talking to you all, feeling defeated and sad and heartbroken. However, I come to you today feeling excited. I feel happy because of the Senate Bill 739 that was passed the General Assembly and is now sitting at Governor Youngkin's desk. So once again, he is representing the people who all the people voted for in office and he is representing us. So we cannot wait for that to be signed. And I did see on the website that the school board, um, the plan of action in regards to masking would, super, would be superseded by the law. So I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to read it. I hope that is the case. I hope that will happen. And I hope that our kids won't face discriminatory comments um, or pressures from adults or other students and action will take place if those students are put in those situations. And I will say, just hearing comments from teachers and other employees of the discrimination that they feel or that they feel or and are receiving from the place of which they work is heartbreaking. And everyone should be heartbroken that they're feeling this way. And I'm glad that they're speaking. I'm glad they're being heard. I'm glad parents are being heard. And please know I'm representing a lot of parents when I'm up here speaking. No way should anyone feel like this. And what's even more heartbreaking is our children are feeling discriminated against, whether they're vaccinated or not. And with, I just, all these kids are out playing together after school, either on the playground, Parents who pick up their kids are out playing without masks. They go to friends' house. We're going out in public, in restaurants. In real life, we aren't wearing masks. Some people are, and that's okay. If you choose to, you choose to, and that is fine. But the majority of people don't. But yet, when we come to school, everyone has to be masked up. Like, it's silly. It's irrational. It doesn't make any logic at all. Again, if you want to wear it, wear it. But we shouldn't be made to. And it's sad that kids have to feel shunned if they don't want to wear it, shunned if they're not vaccinated, being excused from a classroom to eat lunch because they're unvaccinated, or leaving the classroom because they have to eat snack out of the hallway, and being told you need to leave to eat your snack because you're unvaccinated. That is having an effect on our children. It is affecting them emotionally and mentally. And we need to think about that. Think about that. When these policies are put into place, how it is affecting our children. That is what I have to say, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Is there anyone else here in the audience that did not have an opportunity to sign up on the sheet that would like to address the board before we move to the electronic submission? No? Okay. Ms. Holman? Ms. Thomas from Stephen Meyerhofer, 1864-02-02. 
Hoyer, Winchester, 226 one According to the Virginia Supreme Court in a Chesapeake parents case dismissal on February 7, 2022, Senate Bill 1303 gives the board a degree of discretion to modify or even forego those strategies as they deem appropriate for their individual circumstances. Therefore, the school board can no longer say they must implement a universal masking policy due to Senate Bill 1303. The most important section from this dismissal is the following. By allowing school boards to follow the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's recommended COVID-19 mitigation strategies to the maximum extent practicable, Senate Bill 1303 necessarily gives the board a degree of discretion to modify or even forego those strategies as they deem appropriate to their individual circumstances. With respect to implementing policies on student masking, that discretion persists even if Executive Order 2's masking exemption provisions are unlawful. Accordingly, because the school board has license to decide whether or when its power under Senate Bill 1303 should be exercised, mandamus does not lie to compel the school board's action under the statute. The Winchester School Board has been wrong in its interpretation of Senate Bill 1303 since the beginning of the school year. The correct interpretation of this bill is so obvious that the Virginia Supreme Court did not need to hear oral arguments to clarify maximum extent practicable was arbitrary and that CDC guidance did not have to be precisely followed. Every day that this school board continues to enforce universal mandating masking with no opt-out, they are liable to be sued. At the beginning of the school year, every member on this school board wished we didn't have to go back to wearing masks. The school board told parents, students, and staff to talk to the legislature because the school board had no say in the matter. Well, it's clear that the school board has the legal authority to make masking optional. Children have been living in fear for far too long, normal experiences have been lost, and the quality of education, especially for language and singing, has diminished. This community is holding the school board accountable. That's it? Okay, thank you, Ms. Holman. All right, that does conclude our public comment portion for our agenda this evening. And that brings us to item number three on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. Um, this evening we have on our consent agenda approval of consent agenda items, the agenda, minutes, and bills. Motion to approve the consent agenda is presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Holman and a second by Mr. Birchenhoff. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. The consent agenda is approved. Now, moving on to item number four on our agenda, we have reports and presentations by staff. Um, first presentation we have this, this evening is the FY22 budget introduction by Mr. Miller. Good evening, everyone. Um, obviously, what we're doing tonight is sort of the preview and or slash a trailer for what will be coming the next several meetings that we will have. Obviously next Tuesday, we will um, kind of unpack and go into a uh, great deal of detail on the items and the, the requests that have come through the budget and start to se separate those into items. Obviously the governor's budget came out in December. Um, there's activity at the state level determining you know, the, the fate of those items that are on that agenda. So this is the first, just the opening, the quick to set the stage uh, for what we, our work will do in the next month and a half. The, see, uh, this is the our slide that just shows the budget process. It's the same slide that we've been kind of showing and documenting for years, which the important facet of this is that really the process begins in November it doesn't really end until April and or technically all the way till June. The important piece is that, you know, the state is doing 
have taking activity that is affecting our budgets and then internally we have sort of a feedback loop that they can request come we take those then we discuss those then uh, we vote on those and we kind of process through those to get them to flesh out to tiers which then are brought to you uh, to look at um, as with last year we feel it you know feel it necessary to at least say this we do use a scan process which are the steps it's an acronym for what is step two three and four which is see the issues clarify the issues assess the priorities and then the next steps we're using that process to prioritize and or place the items in tiers just like we have been doing the last several years of that process there were a total a grand total of i think 67 um, requests that came in some of them were funneled into oh these are just capital requests and what technically we're looking at here are 58 items um, that are really going through this path directly to the board and those are in the group number one of those 30 of those 58 were personnel related 12 of them were related to adjusted scales six of them related to programs and you can kind of follow along the second chart which is just a kind of a clip of that obviously i'm not listing all 58 in there um you're getting a little more of a description we know what location it's from and then there is you know, is it high, medium, or low versus the seriousness, the urgentness, urgency, and or the potential growth, which becomes a, another factor in how we interpret and or weight the budget, the projects themselves. At this time, the items are really listed in as are they required? For example, health insurance. We know that we'll have a rate change this year. It is required. So it ends up in that bucket. Uh, then we're segregating them into, well, is this a divisional type of expense, the cost of living, a divisional expense? And then, or is it a specific school or department request would fall into the school bucket? Of that, as we go through the required, obviously health insurance is something that we're awaiting this year's um, listing we do know that it will include an increase the question is just how much um northwestern regional education program there's always a fluctuation this is just a very minor increase um there are two positions that are required based on the mandated ratios which is an esl and the counselor position uh, we do have a need for some increased costs to replace chromebooks and the athletic budget at hanley uh, having you know there's just inflation with the cost of the umpires and those fees are going up items in the division bucket at this time are the cost of living that was included inside the governor's budget uh, was a five percent increase on the soq funded positions with the caveat that the locality fund uh, the remaining positions is five percent um the second one is in essence, to do 2% more on top of the five. So another cost of uh, cost to be addition, which again, just 2% on top of the five. There were some targeted cost to compete, uh, basically some various um, increases by job classification. Uh, two, the last two items were, we reduced our budget at the end of last year when the city uh, funded our request less than what was asked for these two items were uh, stricken from the budget and so they are appearing as divisional requests to just simply replace them uh, restore them um, on the targeted list to kind of break that out this is a little newer this year typically uh, it's the first time that we've kind of put them all the targeted in see a little bit later when we talk about it next week um, we went through a different voting procedure as well to kind of get some 
uh, granularity or sort of insight into that. Uh, but these targeted are the SPED feature stipends, uh, the technology scales, bus driver aids and van drivers, teaching assistance, substitute pay, remove compression from the teacher scale, um, substitute nurse, move the elementary registrars to admin two, school nurses, uh, teaching assistants, and school psychologists. So again, these are, they're not, it's not a one, it's not all scales are the same. There, there are different ratios with each one of those uh, scales that we will elaborate on next Tuesday. Mr. Miller, mm -hmm. quick question. This, mm -hmm. The subtitle says additional increase above cost of living. This is the targeted positions for cost of compete, right? This, this is what, if they were numbered, this is item three. Okay, this, this is item three. There's actually, these okay, are a subset of that. Okay. This represents all of them tied together. This is a subset of that breakdown. So the question was whether I put the slide here right after this or wait till the end to tell you it's a subset. So uh, we like it to do it this way. But this is, in fact, they are all part of this. So the cost, okay. Right. All right. The slide says cost of living. Okay. Then I will make sure I take okay. that. So it, it, it would be that. The seven percent, and these would be on top of the seven percent, right? With this, that we're all in the same. That's correct. Yeah. Cool. Uh -huh. Got so, it. Yes, yeah. these should be perceived at this time as all in addition to so right five percent. What were then an additional two? Then, if they're targeted ones, that would be on yeah. top in, 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 excuse me, including those. Got it. I know that you said you're going to bring this back next week. Can you give a little bit of clarification on the difference between the teacher assistant? I see that twice. What high needs is that for students that have high needs or yeah we they are on two different scales so um the high needs uh, tend to be more the sped related okay. um as opposed to the teaching system, which is generic it, it doesn't mean that there isn't crossover in both groups the uh, the specific category that for those that have been much more intensive services. Um, I know you're bringing it back next week too, but I think we're just probably yeah. trying to harm ourselves a little bit. Right. Remove compression and teacher scale. I mean, I know we've spent many years basically looking at that and really, from what I've gathered, we really can't do that unless you almost scrap it all and start over. Mm -hmm. So can you give us a peek behind the curtain of, of sure. what is coming there? Sure. So I would say the peek behind the curtain <laughs> is, in essence, it, has that that process that you described is still valid there in terms of how you deal with getting from here to here and do it in such a way to take out that compression so this is not as it's not what was described several years ago it's just simply it's, it would be very expensive to continue to do that what was taken um we have hidden input from uh, the you know, they were asking. So it's simply at that one step where you might have three or four steps in that one area that's compressed, to simply leave the one alone in the beginning and just, even if it's $100 for each one of them, to just take out the, the step piece of that. And I'm kind of using my fingers as the, they go up and you hit a, a Tail. So if it's four, you just simply raise within that band, even if it's $100 or $50 for each of the steps, therefore they're all on a different scale. Okay. Taking, so we're not, you're not going to have the stair step of that. But it is not trying to put the entire scale on a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mr. Examples of some of what came through the school were to increase teacher allotment and came from Daniel Morgan Intermediate, Middle School, Floral High School. Um, you know, increased teacher sped allotment from John Kerr, um, you saw from Daniel Morgan. You get the idea that of that 58, the predominant, the, the highest number simply came from this group. Um, what we did to try to 
we didn't want to really single out one particular group. We kind of consolidated those when we were putting so we could look at that. And that's what you're seeing in this list that has been sort of compiled to make it easier to interpret and or discuss those items that are in the same group. I'll pause and if there's any questions on this one. Maybe I'm being simple. When we say a lot, when we're talking about bodies and positions, yeah. So, and these are over. This doesn't take into consideration any of the positions that we would be mandated to do no. pursuant to the code. These are would be an additional increases. So, on the previous slide with the division, we're required to fund two, those two positions by code. By code, by SOQ standards, those are we're going to have we have to do those. But it's possible that yes, you know, if if we hire the one, we could or in fact place that person in one of the schools that is requesting. But at this time, that's not been determined. So it's possible that that would solve one of the items, but it's not necessarily designed that it's replacing their request. And when we on the required budget request, it says additional. So is that like one additional, two additional, three additional? Just one. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So to put things into context of the, the three buckets, we kind of priced out what those items are at today i know you know the numbers will shift and change over the next couple of weeks um as we get better information uh, there we must take in effect the first the top line is that inside of the governor's budget there were funding mechanisms for specific programs that increased our budget uh, by just over 2.7 million and those are the program related and or staff related. There is another two point, almost two point, over 2.2 million in a line item called school construction. Again, that I'm separating that out because we could simply say, oh, well, there's $5 million and start, we have to draw a very clear distinction between the two. The school construction money can technically go on for another two years. We do not have to expend the funds this fiscal year. So it's not 2.2 every year, it's 2.2 that you have the option to spend over three years. And as we stated the last time, uh, is still looking for clarification on that. And or, you know, does it, is it significantly altered when the house brought in the middle of crossing over now? And we'll go back and begin discussion. So um, we'll have to stay tuned on that. Inside the required budget, I the moment it's just under 300,000 underneath the division it's just over 4.9 and then at the school level it's 1.3 obviously the one of the largest items is the cost of living it's a significant portion of that division cost so the next steps that next week will simply take you through a little more detailed insight to the items that were on the scan to walk you through those, like you see the score is kind of the way that average you have an understanding of, of those, and then introduce those items as they're being placed into the required the tier one, tier two, tier three buckets, just like we did last year. And that is the last slide. And I would just summarize obviously, um, the cost of living pieces are a big chunk of what we'll be really focusing on this year. Um, and um, to unpack a little bit more under the targeted, we do have several job classifications that even with a 5% or 7% cost of living, they're still what I would consider out of market. I think of our bus drivers in particular, but every single one of those job classifications on the list are, are really challenging. Our substitute teacher pay, for example, is 100 bucks a day. Um, that's just not gonna cut it anymore. Um, and uh, to explain a little further on the compression, was actually a really organic and healthy conversation that we had with WEA around just the value that teachers would 
feel um, in having a, a small differential between uh, step 10 and step 15, for example. So you have, in, in some areas of our scale, you have four or five years of experience that are all getting paid the same. So we used, I believe, 0.5% as a differential where there was um, compression. And so 0.5 times four between that 10 and 14 is, is more than 50 bucks. It's more than 100 bucks. And so while it isn't taking the entire line and making it linear, um, that would be a, a big lift, uh, millions of dollars to do that. It is something, and it, it gets us on the road towards that. So I think uh, you'll, you'll see that dollar amount um, at, at our next meeting. Um, and then the last thing I do want to mention, of course, you, you probably read in the newspaper, uh, you know, we're, we're always fortunate we get to go after all of the counties when budget season comes around. Um, and uh, the need for special education teachers is just paramount, um, just to give you some insight, 40% uh, of our current special education staff are not licensed. And of that 40%, 60% of them are not, don't even qualify for a provisional. So uh, when we talk about the teacher shortage, um, it's real and it's even more real in for, for um, teachers that are qualified to teach special education students. Um, and so our, our good friends in Frederick County, of course, have put forward a an idea of paying them $7,000 more per year um, as an added stipend uh, for special education teachers. Uh, you can better believe I heard about that within about 30 seconds of that uh, being public. Um, and so we're going to have to compete in that arena. Uh, $7,000 is a, a lot of money. And, and while even people who love working in Winchester and, and are very happy, uh, that may entice them to jump uh, to Frederick County. So you'll be seeing a proposal similar to that from us as well. A um, couple of things. Um, I'll take the last one first. I know at the beginning of the school year we talked about the difficulty in recruiting for teachers with special education certifications. As I recall, we were looking to use the CARES Act money to assist us in uh, recruitment and retention. Has that taken off or are we still struggling even with that program? We're, we're still struggling with that program. Okay. Um, and the, other question goes to Mr. Miller, and we've got the ADM set at 39.50. Now, as I recall, and I keep going back to that no loss provision, that's lower than our ADM at the beginning of the pandemic, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the state is still funding at our higher, correct? Yes. So, well, they're funding us. And they yeah. fund us at that level. What they're doing is adding they're supplementing additional funds okay. to kind of make up for the loss of that. Okay. And that ends next school year. Not with this budget, but with our next budget. This, which would be FY24. Okay. We don't know. Currently it is. Yeah. Okay. And just a reminder that you know, well over 150 students mm -hmm. um, that we are down in enrollment now. That's across the state. so. We're in line proportionately with the loss of students across in other divisions. So it's not disproportionate to Winchester. But uh, the big question for the city of Winchester is uh, do those kids come back, right? And when I say those kids, it might not be the same exact kids, but do does our population grow again? Um, and uh, you know, that's one thing that you've heard me now in the last six months to a year really trying to get that message out to our community and our elected officials that we can handle more students in our school division. We have space. We have uh, under capacity, quite frankly, uh, in our buildings. And so uh, you never want to be a dying school system where the enrollment's going down. You always want to be a thriving school system uh, with families and, um, and students. So uh, certainly uh, there's an old saying, housing policy is school policy. And um, you know, that's something we need to remember as a community, that housing policy is school policy. And the decisions we make about housing will always impact uh, schools and the students we have and the demographics of our school division. I'm just thinking about what you said in terms of um, we're under capacity. Are we prepared to meet, let's say, and this obviously hypothetical, let's say we um, got 200 new students within the next 90 days. 
our building right now in terms of capacity? Are we could we accommodate that? Absolutely. Yeah, we could take five hundred tomorrow if we go. Yeah. I mean they'd be sprinkled across K pre K through twelve. So they don't all show up in the same grade level, but yeah, we're here. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, right, our next um, report and presentation is a full bit mitigation update. Dr. Boo. Um, of course, you know, the landscape in our schools related to COVID mitigation strategies is changing quickly. Um, if you listen to the news and read the newspaper, um, you see that that's happening. So um, tonight, I just wanted to present some real-time information for you all to uh, kind of look at and um, discuss. Um, this is Senate Bill 1303, which we have been operating under um, since it went into effect. The top half of that basically is saying that we'll offer in-person instruction and uh, for the required instructional hours, which are 990 hours for our students. The bottom half of that bill is where it talks about um, requiring school divisions to adhere to current mitigation strategies provided by the CDC to the maximum extent practicable. So that's kind of what we've been operating under. Um, of course, we heard tonight um, that Senate Bill 739 has gained some traction and has passed and is waiting on governor's signature, so we don't know how long that will be. So we continue to um, kind of operate under this. So community transmission, um, you can see that lovely spike there in the, um, in the red box that shows that we had quite the surge with the Omicron variant in January. Um, we were at 37%, a little over 37% there um, the week of January 2nd through the 8th, um, over 1,900 cases per 100,000. So that was a very high spike, the highest since COVID started. Um, as of uh, last week, we were down to 15.7%, and then only 285 cases per 100,000. You will see by the um, chart at the bottom, that shows what is classified as high transmission, substantial, moderate, and low. So that will come into um, effect a little bit later when we talk about uh, some of our other um, things that we're doing as far as mitigation. So local information that we have, you'll see that our data here in Winchester Public Schools with our students is very similar to what you saw with um, community transmission. Um, with our students, um, we see that huge spike there. Uh, that happened for us January 13th. These are weekly averages. January 13th was our highest um, highest number of quarantines in the division. We had 275 kids that were quarantined on um, January 13th, and our highest number of positives was 132. Um, so we are going down significantly. Um, as of Friday, we had 15 positive students in the entire school division and 54 students quarantined. So those numbers have decreased significantly over the last few weeks. So we're going to talk about um, some mitigation strategies. Uh, the first one we wanted to talk about is math. Um, and we typically are looking at, we get weekly notifications and I sit in with the VDH weekly for a regional meeting. Um, so we look at VDH and we also look at CDC and what they're saying on certain um, topics. And sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. On masks, they pretty much match. And both CDC and VDH both say uh, masking indoors for um, anybody age two or over. Um, especially uh, VDH, it spells it out a little bit further. It says um, when there's community level transmission that's either substantial or high. So they go a little bit further. Um, so what we kind of like to maybe discuss at some point this evening is uh, we have in Winchester still, we're still in a high transmission status, um, even though those numbers are coming down. So when the community transmission reaches moderate transmission and remains there for seven consecutive days, we're recommending that um, 
masking becomes optional for students. Masking would still be required on the buses because that's a federal mandate. And then staff would still be required under the Department of Labor to um, wear masks as of now. So, um, and then that comment at the bottom is, of course, any law that would go into effect um, would supersede anything that's presented here. So that's kind of our information that we have tonight on masks. Wanted to go a little bit further and talk about our COVID testing. We've had lots of um, lots of twists and turns along the way with um, the COVID testing. Um, BDH and CDC um, both talk about um, COVID testing being um, one mitigation strategy of many that are available. Um, so the board decided early in the fall to um, have our our um, student athletes and our employees that did not submit vaccination status to us um, to participate in weekly testing. Um, so we've been doing that since January. I'm trying to remember the exact date, early in January. So we're probably four or five weeks into testing. Um, it's been going relatively well. However, <laughs> on February 10th, which was last week, we got an email from Department of Health and the vendor that we're using, Scion, is no longer um, under contract with BDH. So we don't have them anymore. Um, and they will be providing a new list of vendors starting March 1st. So they're discontinuing their contract with um, that current testing vendor. Um, so we're recommending suspending our testing right now and revisiting it with data and options um, in March when some other information is available. Um, we do, I wanted to add that we do have, um, we're a part of the VISTA grant program, and um, we are getting lots of um, the Binax mail kits in, and we are giving those out to the schools, and the schools report to me each Tuesday how many they've given to students, how many they've given to staff members um, and family members, and uh, we're reporting those and then ordering more. So we're keeping that flow of rapid tests going into the school. So those are available. Um, to any of our, our folks that need it. So I wanted to let you know about that. And then with contact tracing, we received um, information from Virginia Department of Health on January 26th, and um, they had a long description about contact tracing, and they said basically schools are no longer expected to do contact tracing on every individual case. Um, of course, it is one mitigation strategy that can help, um, a prevention strategy that can help. Um, CDC still mentions it as something that, that can be done, should be done. Um, VDH went a little bit further and kind of gave some factors um, that were relevant as far as um, reasons why it may not be as necessary as it has been in the past. One of those is because the Omicron variant is just so very different. Um, also, the um, the quarantine period has lessened quite a bit. So we went from going 10, you know, being quarantined 10 days if you were COVID positive to five days and then masking for days six through 10. What is happening at the school level? Of course, it's an enormous lift for the schools to be able to contact trace. It's taking an enormous amount of time from the nurses and the administrators at the school level. But what they're finding is that by the time they contact trace, those five days are up and there's nobody to quarantine anyway. Um, I also asked just for some kind of loose data on, you know, what does it look like when you're quarantining your students? How many of them actually are positive? And we can probably count on one hand out of the school division, how many are, are positive after they've, they've been quarantined. Most of our positives, and you can kind of see after the holiday break, that's where our big spike was. Most of them are our household contacts that were positive coming into the school. So that was our biggest uh, our biggest issue. So um, we recommend that contact tracing be for individual cases be discontinued um, under the guidance from BDH. So those are the three areas of mitigation that we wanted to talk to you all about. Let's just open it up for discussion and questions. Any questions for Dr. Bruce on any of these areas? Um, um, just to comment, one, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it looks like 
thanks to that little link that you provided in the, the transmission, it looks like we're on day five of moderate. So two more days, we'll have seven consecutive days in the moderate range based on the VDH. Um, it looks like we've been in moderate since the 10th and the numbers continue to drop, which is cool. Yeah, that community transmission link is, is awesome. Um, I was able to just kind of go through mm -hmm. the last 10 days sitting here. Um, so that's extremely helpful. And I think, you know, accessing this will um, hopefully give communities a sense of the direction one to be informed of where we're at in a community in terms of the spread and where we're at in terms of our number and how that informs you guys what we're doing on the ground. So I really do appreciate that. I believe, I believe we're still, in, I haven't pulled it up. Yeah, we were at what, 46.4 on the 10th and the numbers have continued to drop. Today we're at 36.6. I think we might be looking at a different count. Yeah, so they, they list two different graphs. They list uh, the, case, the rate of cases per 100,000 and then they list the percentage. So the percentage is positive. So if we're looking at the number of cases, we're still in the uh, high range. So the rate, rate of new cases per 100,000? And you have to change it to Winchester City. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I changed yeah. it to Winchester City. We've got yeah, two. Says we're at, uh, I think there's only two um, two areas, of two counties in the entire state right now that are yeah. below, below five. Mm -hmm. So to clarify that for me. So we've got seven day average in cases per 1,000. Seven day average. We're looking at the number, or are we looking at the cases per 100? You're looking at the percent positivity. So if you're looking at Winchester right now, you should see high transmission, 285 cases, and 15.7% percent, percent positivity. So it has We're not dropped. looking at the actual cases. We're looking. Correct. Percent positivity. So when we, so when we link to that. So click on the community transmission link. I click on that link. I go to the VDH site. Yeah, the VDH. Yeah, the VDH site. And then locality Winchester. So I scroll down here and I click on Winchester. Mm -hmm. If you even just hover over it, it will tell you. Frederick? It's really hard to get it. There it is. We're yeah. high. So we okay, so we're looking at the the transmissibility rate, not the actual case rate. Right. Right. I want to sure. I'm still dropping. Well, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, it is very confusing. They list it differently in different graphs. <laughs> So I have two questions. One, um, let's say we get to moderate transmission. We're there for seven consecutive days, and then you know we go to high for a day. Like what? What's the process then? Um, if you go back up to higher substantial, and what is that communication plan? Is this then everybody here back again? And how realistic is that? Um, well, I think a couple things. One is the likelihood of that happening with new legislation is probably slim for none from what if we're reading the tea leaves okay. um so um, but if that aside if that was not in the background then this data comes out every week mm -hmm. um and yeah we, we would then do a week to week based on the bbh guidelines uh, um, you know uh, you know masking optional masking optional but Again, if I were in Vegas tonight and placed the bets on the craps table, I would probably bet that it won't be, it'll be a new point. I think there's an app for that. Is there an app for that? Yeah. <laughs> I think I saw it at the Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I, I think this will probably be a new point too, but on the contact tracing, since mm -hmm. right now it's not a new point, and let's say we're going to stop contact tracing tomorrow, um, what does that do for? the additional CDC guidance that says if you are a close contact, 
you're you know you have to you're subject to strict mask wearing. Are we dropping that too as a result of contract tracing? Like we're literally saying, I know you sat right next to Jason and he was positive, Erica, but we're not not only we're not notifying, but we're not gonna follow the other guidance that says strict mask wearing for ten days. Assuming masks are still on the table at that point because we're still in, you know, high. Is that, that would how so that would work? I would. I think that would be so hard to enforce. Well, I agree, but I'm, I want to make sure. Yeah. I don't want to assume that that's right. what we're doing. Um, when we, you know, regardless of whether we have to navigate in this new room for one day or ten days, I think those are fair questions that we need to be able to answer. Absolutely. Right. So, yeah, the guidance from BDA is basically no contact tracing. Where we would like to spend our effort is. Um, refocusing on cleaning and refocusing on distancing, making sure that those are two of the mitigation strategies that we, we really want to kind of ramp up, especially if we're not wearing masks. Um, so we definitely want to do that so the need for contact tracing would not be as, as strong because we would have that distance and we would have a cleaner environment. Okay, so in this interim period, what I'm hearing is that when you drop contact tracing, you drop everything related to that not just family notification also there's no eating lunch in the um, little theater of daniel morgan intermediate school right because we're not even going to go through the exercise of um, you know there's, there's a difference between contact tracing and quarantining too so this is the new guys that don't even bother contact tracing right. and so by not even going through the exercise of identifying who right. sat next to who, who sat next to who and it, it by default eliminates all those other decision points because now I don't even know no. I, well, I haven't tried to find out and therefore I'm not gonna um, be able to do that but yeah you're right and, it, and it, I'll be honest it feels like whiplash sometimes when you're but then you look at the graph and you can understand why it's whiplash right so mm -hmm. uh, you had a, a huge spike in a short amount of time and now we're right back to where we started almost mm -hmm. now, the students that are positive would still quarantine their number of days so correct <coughs> Um, thank you for this presentation, uh, Dr. Bruce. It's very easy to follow. I think most people might appreciate that. So thank you. Um, my question is, we're not voting on this for another two weeks, right? Not to look funny. Well, technically, you don't have to vote on it. tonight. The purpose of tonight is for us to get feedback from you. Um, you know, we the the testing piece is. Um, is immediate because of our, our uh, issues with the contractor. Um, you know, I would recommend that we um, move forward as quickly as possible. If, if there, I felt like there was good consensus of the board on these items. Um, you know, we could move faster, but two weeks is a long time as well. Um, That's what I was thinking. And so, my, I guess the reason I asked that was: yeah. so, are we going to then empower you to uh, monitor? I don't know, maybe just you know, the whole team monitoring sure. uh, transmission cases. And if they do go to moderate, that doesn't need to be a board meeting held, and there doesn't need to be a vote or anything like that. It's just we say, okay, hey, it's, it's kicked in. This is day eight, or tomorrow's day eight, and we're going to go yeah. no masks. Every single vote that you've made regarding masks or testing um, has always included that caveat at the end that empowers the superintendent to make okay. a game time decision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going into those decisions you always want to have the full support of the school board coming out of them can be a little more flexible especially when you have such rapidly changing landscape um, but again if, if this conversation if i'm hearing strong opposition to that then i would certainly want that's that's why we're having it tonight but if, if i don't then i would i would be empowered to make that decision um, as soon as it happened so we don't need to have a vote to take back the vote that we made back in September that was prior to the governor's mandate. We don't have to repeal that no, procedurally? Not procedurally, no. Okay. You could if you wanted to, um, but you don't have to. Okay. I don't like doing work that I don't have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to put that on our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Just call for uh, So when we'll be looking at uh, local hospitalization, Valley Health, we be taking that into account and not just Virginia new law. You know, we, we according to the matrix that we presented here tonight, we're really 
hanging our hat on community-wide transmission. Mm -hmm. um, now, we do follow the local hospitalization. I have been following that is dropping precipitously as well, so that's a very good sign. Um, but it's, it hasn't become part of our decision-making process to this point. It's kind of a secondary factor um, as we make decisions. The primary factors have always been community transmission, positivity rate, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mr. Walner? Mr. Virginal? No. Okay. So I'm, I'm still drilling down on this because the information is coming from the same site. I think there are a couple areas to distinguish. The transmission transmissibility chart does not take you up to the current day. Right. It goes back a couple of days. But if you go to the other chart and if they're defining it the same way, we have a day by day average. So what are we are we going to be looking at up to the current day? Or are we going to be looking at what they have specifically on the level of community transmission site? Because there there are there are two different there are two different figures. And we'll have to look at all the charts that are out there and see kind of which one is the best one for us to follow. Um, they're all reporting the same, pretty much the same information and the same decline, but we need to determine exactly which chart we're going to report and follow. Because I'm like, okay, how can it be on the one site? I'm getting this, this eyeball. So again, it goes up to whatever period of time they're doing it. But if you go to the other one, you get up to the current day rate. So maybe, since I anticipate people are going to go to this and look, if we add on the, the end of the hyperlink to drive them to the right chart, they'll know what we're looking at. And I will say, with the, again, the masking thing could very well be a moot point as early as Friday, but if it were not a moot point, um, we're not going to make a daily decision on masking. Um, it would be a weekly decision. Um, that data comes out on a weekly basis from the DDH site. My understanding of SB 739 is that that would take effect July the 1st. Does, is, is that accurate? I have not seen that. Unless it's a change. No, I think they're going to try to add an emergency rider to it to make it effective. Right, I'm sorry. I'm yes. Just one question. So, just to pull this all back together, I know we're kind of all over the place right now. If we didn't, basically, we leave here tonight. Quarantine's contact tracing, quarantine is still a thing. Contact tracing is pretty much done. Yeah. Um, and then um, we get the seven day moderate yeah. mask are probably oh, yeah. done, yeah. right? And then um, and obviously the testing, we don't have any control over it anyway. So that's, so that, that's really what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. Testing's gone. Um, the okay. contact tracing for the most part is done. And then we'll see about the mask. On what the governor does and what seven days does, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Any other Mr. Benson? Would we still require quarantine for a close contact from a household member? We're we're not really contact tracing then, so you know, one of you know, you have a family, multiple kids. Right. If it's yeah. reported to us, we would. So we okay. wouldn't actually be doing the contact tracing, but if a parent calls and says, mom and dad are positive and kids are in the house, we would, we would, do, we would do the okay. um, I, Go ahead. I Sorry, I didn't realize you had a point. Um, no, I was just going to say, you know, I feel like the board has been very consistent, as, as consistent as we could be from day one, which is, um, We'll follow the guidance of the CDC and the DDH, um, and and that's what we've tried to do all along, even even before the first governor's order. Um, that's what we voted upon. We were following that guidance, so um, I feel comfortable continuing uh, personally to go forward in that um, manner and empowering Jason to do that. As the guidance has changed, we adjust in, in real time as as quickly as we can. And if the guidance changes again tomorrow or four days from now, then you know we'll continue to evolve as quickly as we can. Uh, none of us are medical experts, um, not just here. But most of our community are not medical experts, and that's why we defer to our, our experts locally and nationally to help help us through this process. Um, so I'm, I'm really comfortable with the 
recommendations that have been brought forth. Um, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I don't know how many times we've said as a board together, just collectively come up to the gate pass. It's been a few times now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I know that that still is true for us. And if we're, if we're talking a lot about empowering parents to make health decisions for their students, then I would like to put forth that we give uh, all of our parents some grace here because if they are sitting next to little Jason in second grade and Jason actually comes down with COVID, but um, my kid was sitting next to him, I would like to be empowered to keep my child home from school, even though he may or she may not be exhibiting symptoms, but it's that first day I just learned that you you know you were sitting next to Jason at the lunch table and now he's out with COVID. I'm gonna keep you home and keep my eye on you and keep the community safe. That's more of a petition to I guess the building leaders and the teachers, the, the classroom leaders to I, I I'm not sure what I'm asking if I'm asking for um leniency on the unexcused absences front or um you know my child just Sat next to somebody who tested positive. I'd like to keep my child home. So a couple of things there, Brian. One is we do have we code those with a specific absence and if they are able to participate in uh, online learning or virtual learning, then they are counted present. However, what you're describing is the essence of contact tracing. Right. And so the only you know, by moving forward tomorrow with what we just presented. The only way you would know that as a parent is if you knew it from friends in the family or and that's what i meant i didn't mean that the school yeah. notified yeah. and it doesn't even have to necessarily be at school the next door neighbor sure. that my kid yeah. plays with every day yeah so now i want to keep my child home mm -hmm. if we're empowering students to make uh, yeah. empowering parents to make these decisions I, I hope we would give a, sure. a little bit of leniency to those parents as well yeah i, I was want, able to just review attendance mm -hmm. protocols and everything but um, we'll certainly take a look at that I think we need to be really careful about that because I don't know what our policy is now, but if I decide to quarantine my kid because they had an exposure outside of school, I don't believe our, the kid can count as present if they participate no. virtually, correct? Mm -hmm. That's not how the guidance we perceive mm -hmm. from parents is coming home, school. at least in the right. emails that I thought. Um, so I, I just think we need to be really careful there and not, I, not open up um, sure. a whole new can of worms. And I just I just want to make sure we're being equitable here. If we're empowering sure. some parents to make health decisions for their kids, I want to make sure we're empowering all parents to make health decisions for their kids and to not be penalized right. based on a good faith. Hey, I think my son or daughter could have contracted this because mm -hmm. they play with the little kid next door who now has COVID. I don't know. I just feel that there's some grace there that I would like to explore. I guess the only problem I have is what if the kid just gets a common flu? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I just don't want to get in this whole picking sides. I mean, the kid caught the flu and the parents thought it was COVID. And they said, no, if you're going with just the flu, I can see people just using that as a band. Yeah, some people probably will. But, it's, I mean, it's, 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 I think we stick with what we have. And just, but it's like with the mass, it's better safe than sorry. Like, you don't want to be spreading this. I understand, but if we're getting to the point where we're going to. I think that we're getting to the point where we won't be getting past all this soon. Soon, we're trying to be hopefully the river better. Oh, I agree. I think it's just something that we shouldn't be jumping in trying to figure out now. When we're still trying to figure out all the stuff that we got going for. I don't think it's going to be like falling off the edge of a cliff, though. I see it as more of a gradual decline where we get past this. It's not going to be we take away masks and it stops. I think we got to we got to let parents navigate this gray area where my kid's now sneezing and then has a fever. You know, um, and he was playing with your kid yesterday. You might want to just keep your kid at home, even though your kid isn't sneezing with a fever. Let me interrupt. Um, I do want to keep it to COVID. Um, I understand what you're saying about the school, but I do want to keep it to COVID. And I think you bring up a valid question or a point. Um, but I do want to make sure that we push it back to the appropriate department to kind of figure out some of those details. Not that we have to ask that, not that we can't answer those sure. or ask those questions, um, but obviously there's a lot to consider. And I think you're right. We do want to make sure that both sides are empowered to do what's best for their children as as we can according to what our policy states. Okay. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll, we'll look at that and we'll take a look at that.
what I think I'm hearing is there's an option and there's an availability. You know, if the child has to stay home, we can do virtual schooling if we notify the school. I would think. Well, we were allowing that for quarantine. When we quarantined you and said, you must quarantine because we did the contact tracing and we sent your kid home for however many days. Then, correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, they had access to virtual learning through quarantining and then they were, if they came to virtual learning. Right. Uh, but it is, a, it is a, you know, we don't do that for the common cold and we don't right. do that for uh, college visit and we right. don't do that for. So, so. An, ex an exposure. I can notify, as a parent, I can notify, keep them home to protect other kids and keep them all on. That's what we have to get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up until this point, it's been our decision. We, we decided you couldn't come to school. Now, to your point, you're saying, okay, now we're getting into this gray area. So some parents may decide, I don't want to have my kid come to school for COVID related reasons, whether it's exposure or, you know, um, but I, I think too, we have to be careful because some of our families may um, overuse that. Yeah. Um, and, and especially when masks go away, um, I can see some families saying, well, I don't want my kid to go to school at all. Yeah, I'm and, about that. You know, it's, uh, we, we will get it from, you know, we, we are always in the middle and we're being pulled in a hundred directions. So, I just want to take the due diligence. So if you'll give us the opportunity sure. to, to analyze those situations and um, you know. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, if this small group has this many questions on how this is all going to work, it seems to me that effective tomorrow doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. We can take the remainder of this week to work this out, get a great communication out to our families that maybe includes an FAQ and yeah. notify, but put some on notice a few days ahead of time on effective this date, we plan to stop contact tracing. What does this mean for your family? Mm -hmm. You know, you won't receive this notice or that notice. And who do you go to if you have questions? And, right. mm -hmm. and try to get out ahead of it to cause less churn and questions into you know, yeah. your team. Um, because uh, there are a lot of little things to unpack here. Yeah, good point. You got that, Maggie? <laughs> 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 I got mean, kind of glance. Maggie, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns for Dr. Bruce? What? <laughs> and our last um, recorded presentation on the agenda is policy for review. Dr. Danielson. Yeah, so um, these policies are just uh, for you to lay your eyes on them. There's no recommended changes, um, but by, by policy, you need to, to look at these two in particular. I did not receive any questions. So. Um, the next group of policies are minor policies. Some of these stem from a, a, a I don't know what Karen was doing some night, but she found some policies oh, she wanted to look at. and so. Just a good opportunity to remind the board that whenever a board member has stumbles upon a policy and just has question marks like, oh, why do we do that? The process is for um, for us to assign another board member to review off cycle. So Erica joined Karen in reviewing several policies, and then they came up with some recommendations, including what you're seeing here of striking the good parenting policy, completely adding, um, you know, just normal grammatical things to teaching and about controversial issues. And the the policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Controversial issues? Mm -hmm. that, come us, did it? that might have been on a regular cycle. Yeah. yeah Far be it for me to touch that rail. I did find that I was in violation of good parenting policy, so I'm really happy that we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never, I've, I've never lived that one. So how you see it? Yeah. 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 And with that, we have some major policies. So we'll start with Aaron. Uh, okay. And then Ed will come up for his. Just for anyone that's following, we are now on item um, five on our agenda. Okay. Five. Mm -hmm. 
leave or made the policy revision? I do not know. By two policies and such on one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good evening. So, <clears throat> carry over from the last board meeting. Remember where we're. Um, this is our review as we're required every few years to review IBEA. Part of that review, um, we're making a recommendation to abandon the existing policy that uh, it's about an eight page policy that includes a lot of verbiage and context that really is more appropriate to a regulation, although we've never had a true regulation for that policy. As part of the SPA's um, house cleaning process that they've been going through, they've struck through any reference to the regulation of that policy and uh, a request to establish technology use guideline. So, what you have included in the um, attachments there for tonight's agenda item is the VSBA, the proposed VSBA portion of IIBEA, as well as the proposed draft of the technology use guidelines that would uh, be a assistant to that policy. I haven't received any other questions since the last board meeting. So I'd be happy to answer or any other questions or any clarifications. Is this what we ask parents and guardians to sign? This is what that is it? We like used when to. We hand them over to them? Yeah, we used to, but uh, because of some changes that were made, I believe about two years ago, we no longer have to do that now. Okay. It's not okay. a requirement anymore. We do still have it as part of the review and signature process annually for staff when we do uh, okay. contracts through HR. And we do we do have another document that parents sign mm -hmm. annually for students, and uh, there's a reference in there that they're acknowledging that they've, they've reviewed and read uh, this policy. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns for parents? Thank you. And, and we do have one action item for this evening. We are on item number six. On our agenda. Oh, Ed's got a policy. Oh, got a, got a which policy. one is it? Yeah, great. Okay. It's at the food services. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good evening. Um, a good old policy ESV. Yep. Food, food, food services. Uh, if you recall, we eliminated this policy after adopting and discussing it uh, via VSBA recommendation. Um, <clears throat> and that, that policy said that uh, social services, we should call social services on uh, students that didn't pay for their meal charges. And we removed that and removed the whole policy. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of an update to that. So we went back to VSBA, VSBA revamped it and then brought it back to us in this format. Um, I'm going to hit the highlights of it. Uh, it's, com it's completely revamped. Uh, and then I'll, I'll open up the discussion if, if you'd like to talk about it. Uh, first of all, basically, the policy provides that we want uh, that we want to feed breakfast and lunch to our students, in Asia, which we do on a daily basis. Um, second, the policy establishes that we do allow kids to charge their meals uh, if they do not have money whenever they go to the lunch. We, that's always been our procedure, always has. Uh, we have no desire to no, no desire to change that. Um, the policy states that we will track the amount that a student does charge because if you recall, federal mandate says that we cannot have a debt on the books. Mm -hmm. So we need to ask the parents to pay that or we need to apply donations to it or we need to ask the school board to pay for it, okay? Um, and so, uh, so we so we we implement that. So the, in this policy, it now states a couple of things. Um, it states what we will not do uh, when it comes to charging meals, and it states what we will. So what we will not do is we will not take the food from the child um, if they if they have charges on their uh, um, on their balance. We will not take the food. Uh, we will not take make them pay by doing chores or working. Uh, you know, at, <laughs> it, 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 it has to be stated, you know, it's one of those things. That, you know, we would never do that, but it's, it's, it's good to put it in talk. We will not overtly identify children that have charges uh, or balance. 
We will not file lawsuits against the families trying to get the money back. And we will not use federal dollars, as I stated, to offset those charges. Again, part of federal regulations we are not recognized. The second section of that policy discusses competitive food. Mm -hmm. And a competitive food um, is any food that you serve between, or not to serve, that is for sale in the school between meal hours. So from midnight to before breakfast is served to after breakfast, uh, before lunch, after lunch, and until uh, 30 minutes after the school. After the school. Those uh, competitive foods, you are allowed to sell competitive foods during those times. However, they have to meet nutritional guidelines. Okay, there are guidelines that are written. And so this policy says that we allow that. Now, but you can only, again, you can only allow those competitive foods uh, to be sold if they meet the guidelines. However, this board has approved in the past, and you are allowed to approve as a board, the federal guidelines state, that you can have up to 30 fundraisers. And this really applies to fundraisers. You, because all the money that we that may be sold in a school between meal hours is really for fundraisers. We don't, the, the food service department doesn't sell the food between meal hours. Um, but this is for specifically for fundraisers at the schools. And so, the board, this board has approved 30 uh, meals, to be, or 30 meals, <laughs> uh, 30 fundraisers to be allowed to where you can sell food that doesn't meet those guidelines. That is the max. That you can school, that you school, that you can apple, that you can. So, for example, the Interact Club sells Krispy um, Kreme donuts. Uh, that counts as one fundraiser for the high school. Um, and so this policy spells that out. It says, hey, do competitive foods, you can sell it to female hours just like the feds allow you to. Um, but you only get uh, 30 of them per year, um, and uh, 30 that do not meet. If you want to sell food uh, that, that meets the guidelines, go for it. You may not make a lot of money, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you are, but, you are, but you are allowed to sell those from the doubt track. Nobody's keeping a tally of how many. Yeah. Yes, they are. That's, that's, well, that will be. That's part of the policy. That's oh, my wow. next step. Yeah. The policy also states that in order to meet those federal regulations, that we have someone at the district or at the school oh, level okay. track the number of fundraisers that are done I without. Yeah. I just didn't think that we actually. Were. Yeah, that are done without the guidelines, and so it can't, and it can't be a food nutrition person. It has to be done. They, they say that they take it right out of your hand. Um, but they say that somebody at the school level. So I'm going to implement something. You know, it's just going to be simple. It'll be a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet that that uh, they keep updated at the school level with which uh, fundraisers they did um, in case we get audited, which we will get audited once every five years by the federal program. We do get audited every five years, and so they'll come in and they'll probably ask for that. We'll be able to show. <coughs> so that's kind of where the policy has gone. Why did we come up with 30? Um, that's the maximum you're allowed. So <laughs> kept the maximum. Yeah, that is the max. Okay. 30 that's is the max. So you're, yeah, I, I brought that to you, you know, way back when, and so that was part of the approval process. So that was, that was approved. We didn't want to sell for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't lose it. So uh, those are the two things, really. It addresses, again, uh, the meal charging procedures, what we will and what we will not do, and it also addresses the competitive food sales uh, between the um, you know, be glad to uh, answer any questions that you might have over that. But, uh, I think the policy is pretty self-explanatory. It, it, it does do a good job of explaining it um, in layman terms. And um, but I'm open to any questions. Uh, if not, we would just push this to the next meeting. Any questions? Just one more. I have a dumb question. Um, what's the date? Yeah. Why do we also need it in ESC? It's JHC of the wellness policy. And it talks about competitive foods. It talks it about does. fundraising. It yeah, because, talks about because you have to put, you have to have a wellness policy that addresses what you're going to do for wellness, and then you have to have a policy that addresses the food service, the actual food service program. And I know that we have this big discussion because I remember it vividly. A lot of our policies do overlap together. That's why they have cross references. Mm -hmm. It, it, 
you know, sometimes I kind of wonder if we, we take the recommendations and just implement them without, you know, do we have to implement them? I understand we could say ESC compliance. Yeah, but but this. that's required that the board have, have policies in place for to make sure that uh, the thought that the board has established a policy for managing that particular program. So I guess you could consider school nutrition and wellness separate policies because wellness encompasses more than just the group. Mm -hmm. so, I understand your question. I, yeah. I, can't, I don't think I have a good answer. Because I remember we had the long discussion about, you know, referring kids to social services because they have a balance. And I thought we dealt with it. So for it to come back up here is. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, that doesn't. Okay. okay, I do have an action item for um, our uh, HVAC system. So I had Frederick Douglass Elementary School. So as you know, we've received about we've received thirteen million dollars in COVID relief funds uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, of that, about seven million dollars, seven point one million, has been allocated to uh, HVAC renovations and retrofits uh, in order to cut the fight the COVID virus. Um, with that large amount of money directed towards the HVAC systems, we've seen considerable inflation in both labor and then um, uh, and in materials uh, and supplies and, and even design services for that matter for uh, the uh, HVAC systems. Um, we had hoped to use the seven million dollars uh, to pay for three out of our four elementary schools that are all over the age, you know, all over, over 25 years old. Um, and then whenever we got into our cost estimations with uh, with our consulting company, we found out that there was no way we could afford to retrofit or uh, renovate all three of them at one time. Um, and so, based on their studies, uh, we uh, determined that. Uh, it would be most efficient to pour this money into one single school so that we got everything that we needed to set that school up for a considerable amount of time in the future. So uh, we selected uh, Frederick Douglass Elementary School. It is, the, um, it is the oldest of the three that were built in the 90s. Um, it also had probably the um, most problems with it. And also at the same time, we've already made some purchases to, uh, to uh, a, a chiller and a boiler in that, in that HVAC system that would allow us uh, to um, put this money into it and get um, as much out of it. Yeah. So, uh, so that is our hope. Our hope is that um, uh, we will be able to get the system designed and then get it out to bed and get that back and be able to pay for it with our um, with all of our code. Um, at this stage of the project, we are in the design phase of that project. Um, we have, uh, have provided you with a proposal from 2RW, um, a company that's based out of uh, Northern Virginia and Charlottesville, uh, for the design and the construction administration of uh, an HVAC system at Frederick Douglass Elementary School. Uh, we did not take it to bid. Uh, we are writing on a contract with Loudoun County. Loudoun County put out a cooperative um, contract and 2RW won that bid. And so we are going to provide that contract uh, for the purchase of their design services and their contract administration services. Um, I will let you know that we are working with 2RW on, an, on another project called the Douglas School. Uh, they, they won the bid for uh, design services for that school as well. And so that, that went through obviously through Shockey. And so um, we are working with them and we are pleased with the work that they have done over there as far as their design of the system and um, their response to the work that's being done there. So we believe that they are a good company to work with. And again, um, procurement-wise, we are, uh, you know, within uh, legal limits for um, hiring them. Um, they are going to, um, they have set up a project timeline, and um, we are going to do design this spring and this summer. And then we will send it out to bid, hopefully by September of this year. The bid process, the review of the bids, the value engineering, all that kind of stuff will take us 90 days or so. So by the end of the year, we should have a good uh, bid package in place um, and have accepted a, a winner of the bid. Again, they will, um, as part of this service, they will uh, help us with that. Uh, and then we will start ordering equipment uh, probably in January of 2023. 
they anticipate, based on again the, the, um, the amount of work that's being done in this area because of the, because of the pandemic, that it would take up to six months to get all the equipment on on site and uh, get things get everything ordered and get shipped here. And our goal is to start um, the retrofit and get it completed in the summer of 2023. Uh, the money has to be uh, expended by September of 2023, and so our goal would be to completely finish that project. Our hope is to finish it before school reopens in the fall of 2023. However, we would have maybe another month or so to, uh, to get it wrapped up if we need to. Um, as a reminder, this project, because it's being done with federal dollars, does require uh, Davis-Bacon Act wage rates, and so that is going to drop up the cost of the project. We actually submitted this to the state back in the uh, beginning of January, and they came back to us and said, why is it so high? And so we had to uh, provide our estimations and the work that we did with the engineering company, uh, and also um, help them understand that, that the big state and the Northern of Virginia area has uh, driven up the price consistent. So, but they did approve it, and so we are ready to move forward. And so I would ask that the board uh, review um, the proposal and uh, if there are any questions be glad to answer them but i would like to get this approved because a couple of weeks waiting again i, I keep bringing you guys stuff i know on, on the single night decision making but uh, again time is money and so i hope that uh, we can get approved and um and get started when do we get our dmp on that do you know uh we're going shoot for the end of the year the GMP is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would the contract price. Yeah. For the for the whole project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By December. Yeah, that's the. Okay. We we would put it out. Well, we've got to design it first. Right. And so once the design is complete, then we put it out to bid. We put out a bid starting in September. About 90 days to go through the whole process of reviewing the bids and value engineering the bids and all that kind of stuff. We hope we shoot. We're shooting for the end of the year. Okay. Yep. Will we be able to do maximum pricing like we did? for the work at Delta, and not to exceed pricing? Yes, I'm sure that, that that's, yeah, that they will set up the, well, we will get bid pricing, firm bid pricing. Okay. I just have one question. Yeah. What is Hoover Dam Reservoir? I have no idea. I don't know why that's even on there. I don't know where that came from. Okay, because when I was reading it earlier, I'm like, I don't see any reference to. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay. I don't know why that's popping up. Okay. Make a motion to approve the two R W proposal for each active design construction contract administration fees of four hundred eighty-eight thousand nine hundred twenty-seven dollars. Do we have a motion? Second. Second by Ms. Coleman. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any motion passes. Hoover Dam Reservoir is a park in Loudoun County. They just, they, they just, the old copy and paste. It's old copy and paste, yeah, and they just put it on stuff. Yeah, probably so. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Spending the money. Yeah, right. spending it. We do have to be a full section. That does conclude our um, public portion of our meeting this evening, and we do have a meeting for full Pursuant to section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia, a motion that the board for being in closed session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters, including prospective candidates for employment and the assignment appointments, motions, forms, demotions, salaries, discipline, or resignation of specific public officers. Appointees are employees specifically candidates for instructional license positions for the remainder of the school year, candidates for instructional license positions for the 2022-2023 school year. Substitute teachers and support staff, posting sites and performance of certain professional staff, and resignations as listed for school board review. Second motion by Ms. Coleman. Second. Second by Ms. Wallace. Any discussion? Is now time to discuss. All right. What was that? No. You just threw me off. <laughs> um, um, 